welcome you all to this event today. And without further ado, I'm happy to hand it over to our Executive Director, uh, Jenny Andrews. Thank you, Ariel. Good day to all of you, and thank you for joining what I know will be a very interesting webinar. My name is Jenny Andrews, and I am privileged to serve as the Executive Director of Malaria Partners International. Today, we have Rotarians and guests joining us from many countries on several different continents. And on behalf of Malaria Partners team, I welcome you all. Malaria is considered the greatest killer of humankind. In 2019 alone, the world experienced 229 million cases of malaria and over 409,000 people, mostly young children and pregnant women, died of this preventable and treatable disease. 94% of those cases and deaths were in Sub-Saharan Africa, where our work takes place. Malaria Partners International is a nonprofit organization founded and run by Rotarians. We're working to ignite an international campaign among Rotarians for the global eradication of malaria. We advocate for malaria elimination through club presentations, um, district conferences, uh, international conventions, and we work with Rotary Clubs throughout all of the world in that effort. In addition, we provide funding through our small grant program to Rotary Clubs around the world that want to get involved in the fight to end malaria. And today, I'm really happy to introduce our moderator and my good friend, Kai Pedersen. Kai is a software engineer currently leading technology for Astrum U. He has over 20 years experience in venture creation and is an entrepreneur at heart. He has a huge track record of success in, get, in setting strategic directions and leading teams to reach really challenging goals. Kai was born in Kitwe, Zambia, where he began a really nomadic existence, living in Zambia, Zimbabwe, Nigeria, Morocco, France, Germany, Denmark, Scotland, England, California, and now Washington. His hobby is mountaineering, which he began as a boy climbing peaks in Africa uh, before moving on to uh, even larger challenges, including summiting two of the seven summits in the world. He has uh, always had a heart for service and he continues making an impact in his community locally and around the world through his involvement in Rotary. He's the current district governor nominee for 5030 and Rotary's focus on polio eradication and fighting malaria are really personal to Kai as his mother experienced both of those conditions in her lifetime. This motivates his desire to see these diseases eradicated from the world. And so with that, please welcome Kai Pedersen. Thank you very much for that introduction, Jenny. Uh, and I appreciate everybody being here today. And as we go through the conversation, it's uh, worth noting, as, as Jenny said in her opening remarks, that there's no doubt that malaria is a killer, is a killer especially in Sub-Saharan Africa where it's devastating disease uh, is, is for the, it's a devastating disease for the communities that it impacts. For me, this disease is personal as it continues to plague my mother after she was infected with malaria. On a much broader level, however, the economic and community impact because of malaria is a huge challenge for those areas that are in the grip of the diseases spread today. It also happens to be a challenge that Rotary is well-placed to organize around especially considering the accomplishments that Rotarians have had in making the world a better place as we fight to conquer polio. Therefore, the Rotarian Malaria Partners Project of scale is critical in its efforts to meet the challenge in Africa by targeting and working to eliminate malaria from these communities. However, the fight against malaria is being waged on many fronts. We have heard news about the new vaccine that is going to be used in Africa to protect the communities. It has an efficacy rate of 40%. And it's an innovation that emerged out of Kenya, which makes this a wonderful example of how Africans are seeking to combat malaria themselves. There are other innovators in this space who are seeking to find ways to reduce the threat of malaria. And one of these innovators is Oxitec, who are using genetically modified mosquitoes to combat the threat of diseases, including malaria, through a project based in Florida. 
but I digress, and we should hear from our panelists on the topic. So I'd like to introduce our two guests today. After their presentation, we'll have a conversation, and then we'll turn to our audience for Q&A. As you listen, please use the chat feature to submit your questions. Now I'm pleased to share a little background information about each of our panelists. First is uh, Meredith Fensom, who is the Head of Global Public Affairs with, uh, with Oxitec. Uh, Meredith leads Oxitec's advocacy policy and stakeholder engagement worldwide. And then we also have Rajiv Vadaneth, who is Director of US Programs, and as the Director of US Programs at Oxitec, Rajiv supports teams evaluating the efficacy and duration of transgenic Aedes aegypti uh, uh, to control this invasive species. And he's also a member of the Association of Clinical Research Professionals. Mm -hmm. Now we want to hear from our speakers about Oxitec and Oxitec uh, Mosquito Project. And uh, without further ado, I hand it over to them. Thank you. Thank you, Kai. Uh, it's our pleasure to join you today. Do forgive my voice a little bit. I, I've been traveling and I might have picked something up. So uh, I, I will speak a little more slowly. <clears throat> but I promise it, it still comes from the heart. We'd like to bring you up to speed on what we've accomplished in Florida to date uh, and, uh, and our expectations for later. I, uh, and perhaps for a broader audience, because we cannot assume that everyone knows uh, uh, all the details about mosquito biology or malaria transmission, there are 3,500 species of mosquitoes. So a lot of people ask, what happens if you eliminate the mosquito? There's no such thing, right? There are thousands of species of mosquitoes. Currently, the Oxitec technology is focusing on one species, Aedes aegypti, which is a globally invasive species native to the continent of Africa, but has spread throughout Asia and Australia, North and South America. And Aedes aegypti is the global principal vector of very serious viruses, principal among them dengue, which is the cause of dengue hemorrhagic fever and dengue shock syndrome. It is commonly called the yellow fever mosquito. That's the common name of Aedes aegypti because it was first identified as the vector of yellow fever in Panama uh, during the Walter Reed uh, expansion in, uh, in uh, South America. It is also the vector of Zika virus, which made global headlines in 2016 and 2017, and the vector of chikungunya virus, a, a virus that causes crippling polyarthritis, and again, was introduced into the new world recently in 2011, 2012. So our efforts are focusing on Aedes aegypti, specifically the Florida Keys. A little bit about Oxitec itself. At Oxitec, we are working to improve the lives and livelihoods of people around the world with a very targeted, safe, and specific technology that uses self-limiting mos uh, mosquitoes and other insects, including the fall armyworm, the soybean looper, and we are working on other insect pests of agriculture and human health as well. Oxitec itself was founded about 20 years ago at Oxford University. We work closely around the world with leaders in agriculture and public health. And to date, we have released over a billion mosquitoes. Our credentials include over 100 peer-reviewed publications and proven biosafety and regulatory rulings globally in every country we've worked in. We thank Andrea Leal, the executive director of the Florida Keys Mosquito Control District for putting this slide together. Why are we in Florida? They, uh, they have Aedes aegypti, yes, but why specifically in the Florida Keys? It really started <clears throat> about 10 years ago when there were uh, cases of dengue in the Florida Keys and other places in Southern Florida. When people hear dengue, they typically think Southeast Asia or South America. Dengue is not on people's minds as a disease that is found in the United States. It was after the uh, outbreak of dengue about 10 years ago 
that the Florida Keys Mosquito Control District reached out to us and said, you know what, this is an invasive species. This is very difficult to control using traditional mosquito control uh, techniques. It is a cryptic species found in or near people's homes, difficult to spray. It is a diurnal biter, which means it bites during the day. And so it, it is not a convenient time to spray. You really cannot spray for adult mosquitoes during the day when pollinators are flying, when you have bees and butterflies out. So if you want to effectively control this species that is found in and near homes, finds harborage in vegetation, bites during the day, using traditional mosquito control techniques is really difficult and not always successful. In addition, there is insecticide resistance in Aedes aegypti throughout Florida. And this is work that the Florida Keys Mosquito Control District, FKMCD, and many other labs, including the USDA Agricultural Research Service have done. So we found that Aedes aegypti in Florida evades pesticides. And when it does get hit, a majority of Aedes aegypti are not susceptible to pesticides. In addition, pesticide use can have a, a, a major ecological consideration. And so every mosquito control district knows they have to walk this tightrope. They are often bound to use insecticides, but they also recognize that a, a large scale use of insecticides can have some environmental effect. So they, they really are looking for newer, safer, targeted techniques for controlling Aedes aegypti and other invasive species. A word about Aedes aegypti. <clears throat> Every time I visit my family in India, I have to scold them because they are breeding Aedes aegypti in clay pots and saucers on their patios and, uh, and front yards. I ask them, don't you know what I do for a living? But that's part of it, right? Aedes aegypti is not a large body breeder. It's not something that breeds in flood floodplains or, or inland floodwater areas. Aedes aegypti is intimately associated with human behavior and human habitation. We have a list of unlikely places where we have found the species, certainly in the clay saucers at the bottom of pots, but also wheelbarrows, children's toys, I once found it in the rim of a metal folding chair where less than half a centimeter of water had collected. What does that tell you? It is very difficult to eradicate or control this species using traditional larvicide treatment or adulticide treatment. The females lay their eggs in temporary, both natural and artificial containers. And we simply don't know where all of those containers are. They are what we call cryptic. Aedes aegypti is not native to the Americas, nor is it native to Asia or Australia. It was most likely transported around the world about four to 500 years ago, and it brought viral diseases with it. And you can see that pretty much most of the tropical and subtropical regions of the world host this invasive species that is intimately associated with human habitation and behavior. Aedes aegypti in the US is found principally in the southeastern US, and so it was for centuries until about 2013. So about eight years ago, multiple introductions of Aedes aegypti into Phoenix, Arizona, and Orange County in Los Angeles, California, resulted in a geographic expansion of this species in the southwestern and California region. Today, Aedes aegypti is found as far north as Sacramento in Yolo counties. It was recently found in Shasta County, if you can believe that. And it is a common, abundant, and ubiquitous pest in and around homes and parks in Southern California. Oxitec's approach to controlling both Aedes aegypti and other 
medical and agricultural pests is this. We, we use what's called a self-limiting gene in the male insect. And that might be a male mosquito. It might be a male soybean looper or a male fall army worm. You know what's better than a human being with a pesticide? A male mosquito in finding a female mosquito. So by releasing male transgenic mosquitoes, let's say Aedes aegypti in this case, the male mosquito mates with the invasive populations of female Aedes aegypti. In so doing, the female is not sterile. Rather, the female lays viable eggs. All her progeny hatch, male and female, but only her male progeny make it through larval and pupil development and emerge as adult male mosquitoes. All of her female progeny die between the second and third instar. What that means when we say self-limiting is that this is a female lethal phenotype. In other words, the gene is expressed in females. And so the larval development is not completed in female larvae. Now, when the next generation of males fly off, they mate with more females in the area. And then when those females lay eggs, it is the same process. All the female progeny stop development as larvae and all the male larvae <clears throat> will live and go on and mate further. Now, inherent to this process is essentially a, a 50% or greater decay from generation to generation to generation. In other words, you cannot eliminate the population because with every generation, only half, because of genetic recombination, only half of the progeny will actually contain the transgene. So that means this is not a propagating gene in the environment. Every time a female mates with one of our boys or his progeny or his progeny or so on, you have fewer and fewer uh, members of the next generation that carry the self-limiting gene. And so to walk through those checks, remember, and this is another fundamental fact about mosquito biology, only female mosquitoes bite. Male mosquitoes do not bite. They do not have the proboscis or the armature to actually penetrate vertebrate skin and imbibe blood. That has nothing to do with Oxytex Aedes aegypti. That is fundamental to all mosquito biology. And so since the males don't bite by releasing male mosquitoes, we are not adding to any biting pressure. They are traceable in the field because our males carry the, the transgene for, uh, for, for limiting female development, and they carry a gene which expresses a red fluorescent protein. So while we look at a male Aedes aegypti from Oxitec, or we look at a male Aedes aegypti from the area, they are morphologically indistinguishable. However, when we look at them under a red fluorescent filter under the microscope, ours light up like a Christmas tree. And so we can tell what numbers of male Aedes aegypti are in the, uh, the, the population. And by collecting larvae in natural and artificial sites, we know the persistence and the mating success of our boys because that red fluorescent protein is expressed in any mosquito that is carrying genes from, from one of our boys. I know I already said it, but I think it's worth saying again. Do Oxytec mosquitoes bite? One of the things we've heard, right, is, oh no, you're releasing mosquitoes. I don't want to get bitten. What effect would that have? Not only do Oxytec male mosquitoes not bite, no male mosquitoes bite. They simply physically cannot. Only female mosquitoes bite. And the way I explain it is, eggs are more expensive to synthesize than sperm. And so from eggs, from the larval development, males have enough 
protein and lipids to actually undergo what's called spermatogenesis. Females sometimes have enough protein and lipids to develop eggs or undergo what's called oogenesis, but sometimes females need to feed on blood and derive the protein from blood to develop their ovaries and to lay eggs. Because our technology limits female larval development, we do not release any Oxytac female mosquitoes into the environment. Because we only release male mosquitoes, they do not bite, and they are very targeted for one species, namely an invasive species globally. So Rajiv talked a little bit about Oxytac's history and that we spun out of Oxford 19 years ago. Um, so it's true that our technologies are very innovative, but they are not new. And this map shows over the last 10 years, all of the countries where we have either done field releases or um, we have positive regulatory decisions or technical opinions. And these are not just for our mosquitoes, but also for our technology to control agricultural crop pests. Um, the technology is virtually identical. We're just using it in, in different pests. And um, if you go to the OxyTech website, because people say, well, gosh, but this is so different. You know, where can I get more information about it that's from third parties? Uh, we have more than 100 peer-reviewed published studies going over the last 20 years, and they are all divided uh, by year on, on our website. So you can view them there. And we get a lot of questions about um, support for our work in the communities where we have either had projects or where we are planning projects. And um, a lot of people don't know, but in 2016, our mosquitoes were on the ballot in the Florida Keys. And residents there were asked if they were supportive of our project. And for OxyTech, this referendum was a blessing because it showed just how much support um, we really had. Uh, I mean, I think most people in the United States uh, know that margins of victory in elections in the state of Florida are usually razor thin, but that was not um, the case with our referendum, uh, where 51, or sorry, 31 out of 33 Monroe County precincts did vote in support, some overwhelmingly so, with margins of 60, 70, more than 80 percent in favor. Um, and we like to say, because it's true, that our mosquitoes received uh, more votes in that election than, than any human candidate. And this is just to show for the Florida Keys project, all of the different actors involved. Our partners are the Florida Keys uh, Mosquito Control District, and they invited us to the Keys, as, as Rajiv said, over a decade ago when there was a dengue outbreak in Key West that could not be controlled, and it could not be controlled because the 80s Egypti mosquito could not be controlled. So at the U.S. federal level, we have approval for this pilot project from the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, we have multiple authorizations in the state of Florida, and our lead regulator there is the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. Um, the CDC did have a role in our regulatory review and, and in the project um, today. We also set up an advisory group um, Three of these individuals are based in the Keys. The other is nearby in Southern Florida. We have the director of a medical entomology laboratory. We have the Department of Health Administrator for Monroe County. Um, he's, he's really interested in this project because he worries about dengue and Zika and other diseases in the Keys. We also have a veterinarian uh, as part of our advisory group, and his interest in this project is with animals because the Aedes aegypti, in addition to the diseases that it spreads to humans, it spreads diseases like um, heartworm to, to your animals, to your pets, things like dogs and cats. And in the Florida Keys, there's a disproportionately high um, infection rate of, of of dogs mostly that, that, that have 
um, canine heartworm. And um, I mean, this, this seems to be because of the mosquitoes. So his interest in our project is, is on the animal side. Um, we also have George Fernandez, who's the, the, the co-founder and the chief operating officer of the Key West Butterfly and Nature Conservatory. And, you know, we have a number of butterfly conservationists and also beekeepers in the Keys who um, are really on, on board and happy to speak out vocally about their support for this project because it helps protect the, the, the bees and butterflies that they are interested in, in preserving. And, and that goes to the targeted nature that, that Rajiv explained of these mosquitoes. We are using the mosquitoes against themselves and they're not harmful um, impacts for the beneficial insects. This is just to show some of the community engagement that OxyTech has done over the years. Um, we've had a steady presence on the ground for the last 10 years um, since OxyTech was, was, was first invited to the Keys. Um, I, I started spending time in the Keys on this project about four years ago and was living in the Keys uh, most of this year. And um, that our outreach has been, um, I mean, it's 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 been extensive. We had to make modifications once COVID started. We couldn't do as many of the in-person events, um, so we launched a webinar series, uh, and you can watch all the videos on our our YouTube channel. Uh, we've had 15 and and counting, so a lot of outreach and um, opportunity to present information and answer questions about the project. And um, we've gone door to door and had outdoor events as much as we can. Uh, we have postcard mailers, uh, door hangers, a billboard. We have a project website set up. Um, and there's there's really just been a lot of outreach. But that's that's important because we want people to have information and to have their, their questions answered. So this is part of our project um, website. We were getting a lot of questions this time last year. We would um, do presentations and people who lived in the Keys would say, well, how can I sign up to request a box or how can I host a trap or volunteer with the project? Um, so we, we set up a section of our project website where people can sign up to join and they can volunteer to be hosts. Um, they can also sign up for updates. We have a listserv that goes out just about every every week with updates on the project. Um, and we're proud to say that because of this website, we know that we have waiting lists um, throughout the keys to host both our boxes and, and our traps, people that really want to be part of this project. Another thing that we did is set up a, a speakers bureau. So organizations like your own, in fact, we've done a lot of presentations to Rotary Clubs in, in Florida, can, can request that we speak on a particular topic um, just to their group and, and we answer their questions. And um, all this is still you know, live on our project website. This is just to show some of the other technologies that, um, or I should say PESS, that OxyTech is, is working with, um, because most of you, your interest is, is with malaria. And we are utilizing our technology now in two malaria vectors. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has funded our work um, to develop strains in the Anopheles stevensi and in the Anopheles al albumanus. Um, and then using virtually identical technology, we are tackling a number of, of agricultural crop pests to improve food security. Um, so the fall armyworm, the soybean looper, medfly, diamondback moth, um, pink bollworm. And a number of those um, pilots ha have been conducted in the United States. So when our mosquito project began in the Keys this year, it was the first time OxyTech mosquitoes had been released in the United States, but it had not, it was not the first time our, our technology was utilized here. Um, this is a picture. I took this picture two, two years ago. I was with our, our CEO at the Malaria No More International Honors, and they were celebrating 10 people and ideas who could make um, the end of malaria possible in our, in our lifetimes. And on behalf of, of OxyTech, our, our CEO um, accepted an, an award for that, and, and we hope we can be part of that reality. 
Um, this just shows with the two malaria vectors that, that we're working on now with funding from, from the Gates Foundation, um, where, where the presence of, of, of these pests are. Um, and the Anopheles stevensi, I mean, just following the news, it, it is spreading, um, I mean, beyond Djibouti, Ethiopia, and it's hitting some, some urban centers. So there's, there's concern about that. And um, one of the reasons that we're focusing on these two vectors is a lot of the places where they are, malaria isn't necessarily spread by other types of mosquitoes. So if you can tackle um, these two, you can have a big impact in, in certain geographies. This is just to, to, to give a little bit more information about um, the Anopheles to Venzi, that, that malaria vector and um, where it is spreading. And um, this is the same for, for the albumenus, just to show um, where it is and the geographies that it, that it can threaten. Okay, so this is the end of our formal presentation. And uh, we just wanted to make sure that you have both the OxyTech website and then the separate Florida Keys Mosquito Project website that we set up with, with our partners. Um, and there's lots of information on, on both of those sites and we uh, encourage you to visit them. But uh, if it's appropriate, I, th I think we're willing to, to take questions now. Certainly, so uh, first of all, thank you Meredith and Rajiv for the presentation. I have a couple of questions before we go to our audience questions. And uh, in, in the meantime, for those of you who would like to ask questions of our two speakers, by all means, please put them in the chat and uh, we'll pick them up and allow you an opportunity to uh, ask those questions. Uh, my first question is, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a, uh, I, I love the technology. I love what you've done. And it, and it certainly seems very thoughtful in terms of what you've uh, uh, achieved, particularly with ensuring the balance of the ecosystem, because as many of us know, mosquitoes are an important food source. So the targeted approach here is, is fascinating. Um, in terms of your approach, how do you think Oxitec uh, differs from uh, in, uh, with, their, with their technology and GMM? Oh, okay. Rajiv, would you like I mean, to take that? I may take a stab at that, sure. If you can hear me okay. <clears throat> I think principally, um, the the approach if we talk about gmn and and other technologies presently uh, the the single greatest uh, advantage is really uh, the the logistics and operational aspect of just dispersing eggs right we don't need to release 10,000 hundreds of thousands of adult mosquitoes every day. I've worked with other techniques and the greatest limitation is that they require either people or helicopters or people in trucks to go site to site and release thousands of adult male mosquitoes. So the operational packing, shipping, and dispersal costs and time are significant and burdensome. And it's a hub that the other technologies need to address. What's unique about the OxyTech technology is that it truly is just add water. These are boxes with eggs in them. And the eggs will have male and female embryos. But when a homeowner or a mosquito control district adds water, shuts it, and then puts it in their backyard uh, in about 10 to 14 days, depending on temperature, <clears throat> those eggs hatch, the larvae develop, the female de larvae cease development, the male larvae then pupate and emerge. So the actual placement, the logistics and operational component of that is is very uh, in the hands of the end user. It's easier, it's incremental, and it is amenable to uh, the democratization of end user use rather than reliance on a 
large scale, uh, highly sophisticated and complicated release of adult male mosquitoes. Excellent, and, and, and I, I certainly appreciate the operational aspects of, of your techniques there, and it's always good to highlight uh, the, the benefits and, and the way that you can actually engage a community around the success. Um, in, you know, as, as we start to think about those benefits, what are the translational, uh, sorry, the translational benefits uh, that you see from the work to other diseases or global health issues? Do you see anything in there that you can align with? A lot of this, uh, I'd say, is kind of two-pronged, right? One is the pilot project in Florida and uh, what, what we hope ending EPA approval will be a pilot project in California to evaluate the efficacy of Aedes aegypti in a highly subtropical environment and in a very arid environment. These are very different, right, the, between the Florida Keys and Southern California. So the first, in a way, end point is feasibility and applicability in very different environments. And if we can show that in Florida and California, the translational component is relevant in Africa, uh, Singapore, Australia. So right now, that is our immediate objective. And, th and that is to show how well do our boys uh, disperse? How well do they mate? And what is the percentage of following generations that carry the self-limiting gene? And I think that's the first point. The second is the, is the uh, translational component of other mosquito species that are vectors of other pathogens. We are focusing on only one species right now, that's Aedes aegypti, which is ubiquitous and, and global, but intimately associated with human habitations. Yes, it is a vector of four very important viruses. However, Aedes aegypti is not a vector of human malaria. And so we are, as Meredith uh, talked about, working on two important vectors of human malaria. Anopheles awfully Stevens eye, is one of three of the most important vectors of human malaria in Asia, in addition to Anopheles chilocephaces and Anopheles dirus. And Anopheles albuminus is one of the most important vectors of human malaria in South America. Now you might notice we're not really touching Anopheles gambiae or other members of the Anopheles gambiae complex in Africa. But this is the start, isn't it? We first want to show proof of principle with Aedes aegypti in two very different environments, wet, humid, subtropical, and extremely arid uh, Southern California, and how that would affect feasibility elsewhere for Aedes aegypti, keep in mind. And the other, by using Aedes aegypti as a model, we can expand and also learn and refine to these two important vectors anopheline vectors of human malaria in Asia and South America. And, and do you get a sense of what that timeline looks like? Uh, you know, I can certainly see the immediate timeline being around proving out the ability to demonstrate efficacy in two different environments. Um, and, and, and the expansion plans, of course, going to beyond that and, and, and hopefully also with other species. But what does that timeline look like? How does that translate to uh, you know us uh, and and the combat against malaria? That's a very difficult question because some of that is yes the biological R and D, but some of that is also regulatory. And while in the U.S. we work uh, exclusively with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, uh, we also work with. Uh, agencies in Florida and in California. That level of regulatory oversight and approval in other countries um, takes time. And I cannot commit to a timeline that, uh, that we cannot control. So when it comes to the biological R&D and at least some pilot projects and field trials with what's called an EUP, an experimental use permit, and some of these other 
uh, regions that are endemic for dengue or uh, human malaria. Uh, that is really a function of, uh, of political and social will among the equivalent EPA type parties uh, in, uh, in other nations. So I know that's not a satisfying answer. I know that. But it will take years for regulatory approval because that's how the beast works. However, after that, our plan is truly to commercialize this and to make this a tool that both mosquito control districts slash public health districts can use and a tool in people's hands. So it really underscores that delicate balance you have with you know getting getting the support at a regulatory level, helping communities understand the benefits and the upside. Uh, it sounds very much like an entrepreneurial problem. <laughs> thank, thank you for understanding. I know the, the answer is not very satisfying. You're asking for a timeline, and but as a scientist, I can use yeah some some idea of the R and D, but there are there are some things we cannot control. Um, I, I, what I'd like to do at this stage is, Ariel, is, are there any questions that uh, we have from the audience that we could ask? Yes, we've gotten quite a few. Uh, I'm going to start with this first one around sustainability. Uh, it says, as the effectiveness wanes through the generations, how is this sustainable? I love it. A couple points. Thank you. And it's a really sensitive and thoughtful question. So thank you to the, to the person who asked. Um, a little bit of background, let me zoom out. Any kind of biological intervention in pest control uses what are called uh, either inundative and or incremental releases. So that's just the language around biological control. Inundative, right? You just put a lot out at once and stop. Incremental, naturally, you, you keep releasing. Ours is a very incremental process. And I think it would work best in areas where you might have recent introductions and where you have wide uh, adoption of, of the technology. So to kind of meet those requirements for any biological control te technology, well, there will have to be incremental releases. The kind of second bullet point under incremental release of any biological control agent um, is the understanding and very deliberate integration of one tool with others. This would help control one mosquito species, Aedes aegypti, and that could be really important in an area endemic for dengue or yellow fever or Zika. It's not going to control any other species, right? And so this technology would have to be one tool in a toolbox with larviciding, adulticiding, uh, the very targeted removal and treatment of uh, cryptic larval habitats. So for it to truly be sustainable, and I love what that means, right? For it to be sustainable, it would have to be incremental over a long time, and it would have to be one part of a highly integrated vector management program. And if I can add, the fact that our technology is self-limiting and does not persist in the environment, that, that's an advantage. And that's something that, that regulators are, are, are more comfortable with. I mean, we talk about, you know, the challenges getting, getting these products to the people who, who need them. But the, the fact that this is self-limiting and does not persist, um, it, I mean, it, it is an advantage and it's something that the regulators seem to um, prefer. And just to add to that question, as a follow-up, someone has, ha has asked us, how long do you think um, it will take to have a significant impact on the eradication of malaria-bearing species? So to, to be fair, right, we have not evaluated it against any Anopheles species. Only mosquitoes in the genus Anopheles transmit the parasites responsible for human malaria. Uh, and so we, well, I can't answer that since we don't know First of all, right, we'd have to take a step back and say, how long would it take, one, for Oxytec Anopheles stevensi or Anopheles um, albuminus to result in a significant decline in 
local populations of, of these two species. The second question is very complex, and this is work uh, that, that goes back 30 years. We cannot assume that there is a direct correlation between mosquito population density and risk of malaria parasite transmission. It is not a one-to-one. -one. It is not a sine-cosine. In other words, a 50%, let's just say, a 50% reduction in Anopheles uh, Stevens eye populations does not mean a 50% reduction in new malaria cases. It's very much what in epidemiology is called the 2080 rule. In other words, about 20% of the population is responsible for 80% of the transmission. So in practical terms, it may well take an 80 or 90% reduction in local Anopheles populations to result in even a 10 or 20% reduction in new malaria cases. So that is a very gated response. The first metric is what is the dose and duration of release of Oxytech Anopheles mosquitoes to engender a reduction in local Anopheles numbers. The second metric is what does that reduction really mean in terms of reduction of new malaria cases? And just, you know, the Anopheles we haven't released in, in the environment yet, um, but the Aedes aegypti we have been working with out in the field for uh, 12 years. And we have hit um, suppression rates consistently in Brazil of over 90%, over 95%. Um, and, and anecdotally, I mean, we, you know, we're vector control, we're not disease control, um, we're not conducting epidemiological studies, but, but anecdotally, I mean, these communities that, that we've worked in in Brazil, where we've had those very high suppression rates, um, they've, they've seen a, a, a steep drop in, in their dengue cases. And some of those communities have, have thanked us, you know, as COVID started, they said, you know, we wouldn't have been able to handle um, these COVID cases and a dengue outbreak. And I mean, it can become really important during, during a pandemic. I mean, even in the Keys, you know, last year, um, there was a dengue outbreak in the Keys last year. There were 70 cases near near Key Largo. And having to manage something like that while you also have COVID, it's just, it's too much for many communities. Uh, what Meredith points out is the importance of integrated vector management. With targeted larviciding and adulticiding, you might control about 50% of Aedes aegypti. And as we've seen, with certain districts in uh, Southern Florida, their budget for controlling Aedes aegypti has increased from about 17 to 34% in the last 10 years. Their efficacy in controlling Aedes aegypti has flatlined. So their budgets have increased two times and they're not controlling any more Aedes aegypti, principally as a function of insecticide resistance. So using something like the Oxitec technology to, one, reduce the population and then hit them with adulticide could be a gated approach to controlling the population so that it is below a, thres a threshold that puts, it, that puts us at risk for dengue transmission. Okay, let's ask one more question. Um, this is a long one. Bear with me. It says, how many male mosquitoes might be released at a site and how long does it take for the population of female mosquitoes to be reduced by half or more? How large of an area might be targeted and does the impact spread beyond the original site? If yes, how far and how rapidly? There's a lot to unpack there, right? So a lot of these metrics we are currently measuring, and we are first obligated to report to the EPA. So I, I can only respond in certain generalities that we are releasing at what we're calling a low dose and high dose rate. So it might be one to 3,000 per acre per week. And we're doing that intentionally because any quote unquote pesticide and this is registered as a pesticide with the EPA. You have to understand, one, 
your application rate, and two, the duration of that application, right? So what are you releasing per day, per week, per month? And then the follow-up is really the efficacy question. We are not measuring, uh, or I'll put it in the positive, right? We are measuring how far they're flying. So we know that our male Aedes aegypti behave just like the local Aedes aegypti in terms of their flight radius. Uh, we know that they are not flying very far. They're not flying over a kilometer. And that they do tend to fly and mate in and around human habitation. The real crux of the, the uh, audience member's question is, um, how many do you need to release to get a 50% reduction? I don't know the answer to that, right? We're looking at certain metrics in terms of flight radius, mating success, percent fluorescence in uh, larvae, and the duration of that. So very soon, we're going to see how long does it take when you stop releasing that you still see fluorescent larvae. In other words, what is the duration or persistence of effect? We are measuring those metrics now, but we don't know, I can't answer that right now, as to what should the application rate be or for how long in order to get 50% suppression. I think that it's a very important question. Um, I think it's a operationally important question, especially for mosquito control districts. And it is something that we will attempt to clarify in 2022. Thank you so much. And unfortunately, again, we won't be able to answer the last few questions, but I'll share those with um, our speakers today and hopefully we'll have that as part of our transcript. I'm gonna hand back over to Jenny now. Thank you, Ariel. Uh, and thank you so much to Meredith and Rajiv. This was an absolutely fascinating presentation. Um, one of the best I've heard in a long time. So I really appreciate your um, time with us today. We're at time, so I want to thank all of you in the audience for joining us. And in a day or two, a recording of this webinar will be available on the Malaria Partners International website. So if you would like to have, um, if you'd like to listen that to that, please um, go to our website. And if you would like to have one of our board members make a presentation on malaria to your Rotary Club. Um, our website also contains information on how to do that. So thank you, and we hope you will join us in the fight to create a malaria-free world.